do we need to review the basic problem or does everybody remember? So we're sending a signal via its Fourier transform. Okay, and uh, some of the frequencies are lost and we want to determine reasonable conditions under which we can recover the signal. Okay, so what we saw yesterday is that if the size of the support of the signal times the number of missing frequencies is less than n to the d over two, then we can always recover the signal. But today we're going to see that in most cases we can do better. Okay, so here, the last thing that we did in yesterday's lecture is we introduced a restriction estimate for a set S. So we say that a set S satisfies a PQ restriction estimate with constant CPQ. If for any signal we have the uh, normalized LQ norm of the Fourier transform is bounded by a constant CPQ n to the minus d over two and times the non-normalized LP norm of the function. We have also discussed the fact that P is, uh, when P equals one, this always holds. Okay, and since this always holds, so do you remember why this always holds from P equals one? Because you can simply apply the definition of the Fourier transform and dominate the modulus of the Fourier transform of M by N to the minus D over two times the L1 norm of F. And since the rest is the average, you get the inequality was constant one, okay? Which means that we can't get anything new from considering the case P equals one. So what I mean by a non-trivial restriction estimate is a restriction estimate when P is greater than one, the constant CPQ is some sensible number like 10 and N is huge, okay? So my measure of large is either the American national debt or the number of administrators in a typical American university. Okay. So, of course, since I've hinted that we're going to use uh, the restriction property to, uh, uh, to improve our uncertainty principles, uh, I should probably convince you that these restriction estimates hold at least once in a while, right? In fact, they typically hold. And this is what's called a universal restriction theorem. So what we mean by universal here is that there are no hypotheses. In other words, all the properties of the set are built into the constant, or more precisely, the constant is explicit, okay? So, um, so let me give you an example right away. So notice that the exponents here are four thirds and two, and I'm going to explain where that comes from. But suppose that S, suppose that D is two and N is prime. Okay, do I do this soon after? Uh, yeah, I'm going to describe this after. So for now, let me go into too much detail. Suppose that S is a circle n is prime and d is two, then the size over n to the d over two is approximately one, not exactly one, because the size of the circle is n plus or minus one, just elementary number theory. So this term is under control. And here, this maximum of the additive energy divided by the size of u squared is at most three. And I'm going to describe why that is a bit later. Because remember, we discussed the additive energy. And so then you see that in the case of a circle, when n is prime, this inequality holds. Okay? Yes, please. What do you mean by a circle in Z? Uh, circle in Zn2 is the set of x such that x1 squared plus x2 squared equals 1. Okay. Yeah. And what's remarkable is when n is prime, that circle has many of the properties that we are used to from the equation of things. Okay, and I'm going to say more about that a bit later. Okay. And so before we prove the universal restriction theorem, what I want to describe is a very simple mechanism that tells us that we can always improve the classical uncertainty principle if we have a restriction. 
So this is a theorem from last year. Again, joint work was Zita Mayeli. Suppose that F and its Fourier transform are signals from Z and D to C. F is supported in E, and F yeah. is supported in S. Is the setup clear? Okay. Suppose that S satisfies the PQ restriction estimate. We don't know what that is. It's this right here. Okay. Uh, then the size of E to the one over P times the size of S is bigger than or equal to N to the D over CPQ. So, so remember when P equals one, the restriction theorem always holds with constant one, in which case you simply get the uncertainty principle. But if P is bigger than one, N is huge and this constant is under control, then you get a better uncertainty principle. Do you see why it's better? Imagine P is four thirds. Then what this says is the size of E to the three quarters times the size of S is bigger than or equal to N to the D times divided by some manageable constant, right? So the right-hand side is up to a constant the same as before, but the left-hand side is smaller. So it's less, so it's less restrictive, right? Because you have the size of E to the three quarters, so E could be larger and we're still okay because we're raising it to the power of three quarters. Right? Everything makes sense? So we kind of, for some special sets, want to have better, like, equality. Well, that's the thing. The set is not special. Um, uh, it is, um, I will not be able to, to give you complete proof of this today, but for a typical set, you get an improved restriction S. Uh -huh. You're... You know, you're much more likely, as I said yesterday, to get hit by lightning, not twice, but three times, than you are to find the set, accidentally find the set for which the restriction, the improved restriction estimate does not hold. Okay. I stress accidentally, because if you want to find it, you can. You can just take a plane. All right. So let's prove this. So... All of these proofs, as you probably notice, begin in the same way. We write F in terms of its Fourier transform. We restrict to S because by assumption, the Fourier transform is supported in S. Okay? We apply Holder's inequality. You've seen this trick several times. So modulus of F of X is bounded by N to the minus D over two, size of S, and then the normalized LQ norm. This make sense? And now we apply the restriction assumption. So we, we assume that this normalized LQ norm is bounded by CPQ n to the minus D over two, which is combined with this n to the minus D over two. Size of S comes from here, and then you have LP norm of that. Okay, so do you see what happened? We just applied the restriction estimate, with, which we assumed. Okay. Uh, so now, since F is assumed to be supported in E, we restrict the LP norm to E. And when we put everything together, we get this. Modulus of F of X is bounded by the size of S, bounded by CPQ, n to the minus D times the LP norm of F. Okay, and this is an important moment. Okay, so you see how we got here? Because now the right-hand side is a constant. The left-hand side is a function. So we can sum the left-hand side over x and e. Well, first raise it to the power of p, sum over x and e, and divide both sides by the LP norm. And we get this condition, right? The size of e came down from summing over e. And then we take roots and we are Okay? So you see the trick? We simply applied, we applied, so holders inequality, restriction estimate, restriction estimate, uh, assumption that F is supported in E, put everything together, raise both sides to the power of P and sum over E, that gives us the size of E. 
okay? And it's bigger than or equal to n to the dp. So this is raised to the power of p, and now you take roots, okay? So in other words, whenever you have a non-trivial restriction estimate, you have a non-trivial, uh, you have a non-trivial um, improvement in the uncertainty principle. And you have already seen that if you have a better uncertainty principle, you have a better recovery condition. Still not quite as good as what you were asking for. We're gonna get to that later, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, but closer, okay? So this completes the proof of the uncertainty principle via restriction theory, or more precisely, the first version of it. Okay? In mathematics, understanding comes slowly, at least for me. And so we proved uh, this result a year ago, and then we spend the next, every few months, we realize that we can do better. But here's what's interesting, and this I want to relate, is that even though we came up with improvements, all of the steps proved useful. Because this approach, even though we can get better exponents with other approaches, is very useful because of its flexibility. And for example, in terms of applications to data science, discrete time series, et cetera, it is this approach that proved to be the most useful. Just unfortunately, I will not have too much time to talk about that today. Okay, so now let me go ahead and prove the universal restriction theorem. So you remember what it said? The universal restriction theorem said that no matter what S is, okay, so F is arbitrary and S is arbitrary, then you get this inequality where you should think of these first two terms being multiplied together as being the constant. Okay, now this constant may turn out to be bad, but still, Universal statements are always or are typically useful, right? Because they hold no matter what. You don't need to assume anything about us. Okay. And also, there is another reason why I'm including the proof of this in this lecture. It's because um, so the point that I made over and over and over, and this is a deeply important ideological point to me is that mathematics should not be divided into discrete and continuous, okay? This is a very, very bad idea. I can't tell you how deeply I feel about this, okay? And the proof you're going to see in a discrete setting is in many ways just a rephrasing of a classical, beautiful argument by Charles Pfefferman in his 1973 paper on buckner reese means. It's a completely analytic paper proving a beautiful conjecture and analysis. And, if, and you need to uh, read it really, really carefully to see why it's the same proof, but it's the same proof, okay? Because one thing that happens in analysis is that it is impossible or almost impossible to write analytic proofs in a completely pretty way because they're nasty calculations, they're tails, et cetera, et cetera. But inside somewhere, there's a core idea. And the core idea in Pfefferman's paper is that if you take a circle and you take vectors x and y and x prime and y prime and you add x plus y and you add x prime plus y prime, does that sound familiar? It's the additive energy that we discussed. That the only way x plus y equals x prime plus y prime essentially is if these two pairs of vectors are the same up to permutation, okay? This is an idea from high school geometry, very, very simple. And he exploited it in a, in a, in a wonderful way. Uh, here, we're not going to see this idea directly because we are proving a more general statement. However, it's there. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the proof. Okay. So I gave you a hint that, um, that additive energy is involved, right? Yesterday, we discussed additive energy. And we were able to express additive energy in terms of what? In terms of the L4 norm of the Fourier transform of the indicator function. Remember this, right? Which means that if we want additive energy to come up, we need to look for the L4 norm of the Fourier transform, okay? So we start with a summation of F hat of M squared, and we simply write it out, okay? So we take f hat of m and we write, we write it as f hat of m times f hat of m uh, complex conjugate. 
this complex conjugate, we give it a name, which is G. And then you might wonder, what is the point of giving names to something that's already been named, right? But think back to first year calculus, where um, at least I remember being very excited to learn that you can compute the integral of e to the x sine x by integrating by parts twice and by solving it in terms of itself. We're going to do that here. So this expression equals, you, if you just write out the definition of the Fourier transform and you change the order of summation, it equals summation over x, f of x, one s g head of x. Okay, this just directly follows from here. And now we apply Holder's inequality with exponents four thirds and four. Why four thirds and four? Well, we just we just talked about that. We want we want to obtain additive energy. Why do we want to obtain additive energy? Well, we already talked about that because if additive energy is non-trivial then we're going to get a better uncertainty principle. Make sense? Okay. So this expression is under control. We want to write this out. So you've seen this expanded yesterday. Remember when we talked about the connection between additive energy and the Fourier transform. So you simply write this four times. So we had a discussion about this in this point. Right? Okay. And then you have this summation of chi of x, chi of m plus l plus m prime minus l prime. Oh, I fixed the parentheses from Lviv. Yes, there was one parenthesis missing. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now you sum this, and this will be zero unless m plus l is equal to m prime plus l prime. Okay? So how do we estimate this? There is a simple trick. And the simple trick is to first assume the g is an indicator function of a set. If G is not an indicator function of a set, it's a linear combination of indicator functions of sets. And what's, what I'm going to show you is going to easily follow. I didn't write it out because it's a technical calculation. Okay, So I'm just going to handle the case when G is an indicator function of a set. But I promise you okay, that uh, if you understand this calculation, going to the general case is just a matter of, of suffering for 20 minutes, okay, literally. So if you do this, imagine that G is an indicator function of a set, right? Let's say, and let's call this set U. Then what do you get? You're just solving the equation M plus L equals M prime plus L prime over the set U, okay? So what you're going to get is n to the minus d. This was inherited from before. Now you get lambda of u divided by the size of u squared times the L2 of z and d norm to the power of four, right? Because if g is an indicator function of u, then what is its, uh, what is its L2 norm? Its L2 norm is just the size of u to the power of one half. You raise it to the power of four, you get the size of u squared, and it will cancel with the u squared on the bottom. Why am I taking the maximum? Well, because G could be G could be an indicator function of any set that's contained in X. So you have to take a maximum over all of them. And so then you take the fourth root and bound this by n to the minus D over four, the maximum of lambda U over the size of U squared to the power of a quarter times the L2 norm. Right? This is, we just take the fourth root. And now you put everything together and you get the expression that we need. It's just a matter of rearrangement. Okay, because the interesting point here is, do you remember what G was? G was just a complex conjugate of one S times the Fourier transform of X. So it's the same quantity. So the L2 norm of G is just the square root of the quantity we started with. Okay, here, let's go back. Right, so G is just a complex conjugate of the Fourier transform restricted to S. And on the left-hand side, we have the L2 norm squared of G. Right? So here, 
when we end up with the L2 norm of G, it simply tra travels over to the other side of the equation. And we get the result. Okay? But like I said, if you if you become interested in, in, in analysis, sooner or later, especially harmonic analysis, sooner or later you, you're going to read this paper by, by Pfefferman. It's from 19, 1973 Israel Math Journal. And it's a proof of the Buckner-Reese conjecture in the point, right? And it's, it's always, since you've seen the discrete argument first, it will be very interesting because once you dig through the details, you'll find this argument in there. Okay. And so this completes the proof of the universal restriction theorem, which, uh, which we can then put to use for which sets? For sets that satisfy good energy properties. Okay, and so let me maybe now is a good, good time to give you an example. Uh, so if S is the set of X in ZN2, such that X1 squared plus X2 squared equals one, okay, and odd prime. Okay, so here's a really nice exercise, right? I promise you, you'll not get stuck. You just have to, just have to do it. Is that if you want to solve the equation, x plus y, or let's use notation from the proof, m plus l equals m prime, m prime plus l prime, where m, l, l, m prime, and l prime are in z uh, on the circle. Okay, then there are only three ways this can happen. Three, M is equal to M prime, L is equal to L prime. Two, M is equal to L prime, and L is equal to M prime. And three, M is equal to minus L, M prime is equal to minus L prime. Okay. In other words, your intuition from the Euclidean case, right? Imagine this is M and this is L and this is M prime and this is L prime, right? If you add M and L, you get this. If you add M prime and L prime, you get this. They will never coincide unless they're essentially the same pair, not essentially, if they're the same pair or if the points are antipodal. Okay. So, um, if you are experiencing doubt that you'll be able to do this quickly, don't. This doubt comes from, uh, from the following thing, is that you might be under an impression that this is somehow a geometric or trigonometric property. It is not. It is pure algebra. It's just that in, in Euclidean space, algebra and trigonometry happen to yield the same result. But you don't need trigonometry at all. You can just write equations and you'll get it. Okay. So in particular, in the case of the circle, we get an L four thirds to L two bound, in this case, P equals four thirds, with the constant three to the power of one quarter. If you ask me if three to the power of one quarter is the best constant, I will tell you honestly and directly that I have no idea because best constants are very high. Does this make sense? Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. So an additive energy uncertainty principle. It would be very convenient to have a version of the additive energy uncertainty principle purely in terms of the additive energy of E and S, right? In this universal restriction theorem, you just saw this quantity maximum over u in s of lambda of u divided by the size of u squared. It's a very pretty looking quantity, but it has this disadvantage that in general, it's very difficult to compute. In the case of the circle, no problem. But imagine a general set where you have, to, anytime you have to prove something for every subset, you should be scared, okay? 
But since in the case of the circle, you get this algebraic conclusion, there's no, there's no issue at all. Life is good. Just once again, the compute this S is in, in frequency space. Like, yeah, here it's, it happens to be in frequency space. But of course, we could, I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up. Look at the statement of this theorem. Right? Look at the statement of this theorem. And we could completely recycle this. We can change the roles of E and S. Why can we change the roles of E and S? Because of the Fourier inversion formula, right? So we can obtain the same result with the properties of S replaced by properties of E, or we can combine them as convex combinations. Okay, so in other words, you get an improved condition, not only if your set S is nice, but also if your set E is nice. So why do I keep emphasizing the set S? For practical reasons. Because what is E? E is a support of your signal. I don't know it. You don't control your signal. You want to be able to control every signal, right? You, you don't want, I don't know, your commanding officer to tell you, I want to send this signal. You tell him, no, I'm sorry. This signal doesn't satisfy the right additive energy properties. <laughs> yeah, this is not a conversation you want to have. And, uh, but, on, but what is S? S is the set of missing frequencies. Um, and quite often, the loss of frequencies is random. So it's much more reasonable to make assumptions on the set of missing frequencies. Okay, awesome. So let's go back. And yeah, let me just prove this. Okay. So here's a theorem, and uh, so this is a result of a, of a project that I've launched a few years ago where I started um, involving strong undergraduate students in, uh, in real research problems, not baby research problems, but real research problems, okay? And uh, so this is joint work with uh, uh, Karam Aldale, Josh Yosevic, yes, I'm related to him, and... Uh, James Jemangal, Azita Mayeli, and Svetlana Peck. So Svetlana Peck is now a graduate student at Penn State, and um, uh, Karam, uh, Josh, and uh, Jemangal are still undergraduates. Okay, so here's the theorem we proved. Suppose you have a signal uh, where support of F is E and support of the Fourier transform is S. Then you have n to the d bounded above by the additive energy of E raised to the power of alpha over 3 times the additive energy of S raised to the power of 1 minus alpha over 3 times the size of E to the 1 minus alpha times the size of S to the alpha. Okay, just look at the case alpha equals 0. Okay, just focus on the case alpha equals 0. Then, um, yeah, if alpha equals zero, then you have lambda to the one third of S times the size of E is bigger than or equal to N to the D. Now, lambda of S is at most the size of S cubed, which means that lambda of S to the power of a third is at most the size of S. So this implies the classical uncertainty principle. But if the energy of S is, a, is even a little better than trivial, you get an immediate improvement. Okay? And this is purely in terms of energy properties of S and E, so you don't have to, uh, you, don't, you don't need information about subsets. Right, by the way, so I mentioned that you should be scared of subsets. Let me tell you why. Imagine that you have, you're again in, in two dimensions because it's easy to visualize, Z and two. And you have a set of size approximately n to the three halves, which has excellent energy properties. But then you just add a straight line. Additive, uh, straight line only has size n, so you're not increasing the size by much. But the additive properties of a line are horrible. So for each, 
for for points in a row and you know, not in a row if you want to do some exactly <laughs> exactly this is why this result is uh, is more flexible in a way okay excellent so let's prove the additive energy and certainty principle so as you know all these proofs begin in the same way right you're used to it at this point we apply the holders inequality uh four thirds four we are used to that also okay and here noticed that this is a very important trick it's simple but very important in fact it's not a trick it's an idea is that m sum over m is in s but here we replace the sum over m in s by sum over m in the whole space okay so it looks like we are giving up information so the question is what are we getting in return <laughs> what we are getting in return is something more important we write out the fourth power. You have seen this several times. But now, because we are summing over the whole space, we get orthogonality. Okay? Usually, orthogonality trumps size. Right? And one is often willing to sacrifice a lot just to gain orthogonality. Okay? So, from this, you get n to the minus d, summation over x plus y equals x prime plus y prime but now you have four copies of f and what are we going to do with these four copies of f they're interfering with our ability to use the additive energy estimate so what are we going to do with them we're going to estimate them out if you don't like something in mathematics you estimate it out you can okay so we're just going to bound this by the additive energy of e n to the minus d times the L infinity norm of f. Just, I mean, L infinity norm in discrete context is kind of pretentious. It's just a maximum, right? And it's raised to the power of four. I mean, the only reason Azita and I use this L infinity notation here is because we are analysts and, you know, this is what we are used to doing. Maximum is five. So if you put everything together, you have that modulus of f of x is bounded by n to the minus d over 4, size of s to the 3 quarters, n to minus d over 4, lambda to the 1 quarter times the L infinity norm. But now you just take the maximum of both sides. You will have L infinity on both sides, and you cancel it out. And when you cancel, it, cancel out the L infinity norms, just the maximum, if the maximum is 0, there's nothing, to be, there's nothing interesting going on. And you get this equation. And now you raise both sides to the power of four thirds, and you are, and we are done. Do you see why we are done? The other equation looked more complicated. The reason we are done is because we can reverse the roles of S and E for free. And then it's just a convex combination. In fact, Alexander raised an interesting point of whether the convex combination is ever better than the endpoints. I haven't had time to think about it. You're probably right that it's not. Okay. So it's probably if, one of If it's a like logarithm, then. Oh, is, is it that easy? Jesus. Is it that easy? You take a log, so you have a. Let me think. Let me not try to think on my on my feet. That, that never works. Right, so you have this, and then you have exactly the same version with S and E reversed. Okay, and this completes the proof. Does this make sense? Okay, so what we have seen is that if added any improvement in additive energy, and somehow this is a bit more tangible than the improved restriction theorem, right? Because especially if you're not used to restriction restriction theory, it's probably not quite as convincing. That, that typically holds, right? But I think that I shouldn't have much trouble convincing you, even without making calculations, that typically, if you if S is a random set, then its energy is probably better than than the tri than trivial, right? Okay. All right. So here is one of the few results in these lectures that I'm going to uh, state without proof because. I think it would be a, a good three or four lecture, lecture series to prove this result, okay? And this is, to me, I think it's easily my favorite result in analysis. 
uh, by Jean Bourguin. Uh, and he proved the following thing. So the first time I read it, I simply didn't believe it. So G, is any locally compact abelian group? Do you guys know what locally compact abelian groups are? No, never mind. Let's skip to the next statement. Uh, so this is the consequence of, uh, this is Bourguin's result uh, specialized to Z and D. And it's no harder, but also no easier to prove it in Z and D than it is in the general context. So you have, a, you have a signal F, and the Fourier transform is supported in S, where S is a generic set of size n to the 2d over q. What does that mean? You simply, it's, a, it's a random set where you choose each point with probability p so that the expected size of the set is n to the 2d over q. Okay, and here, this is, this is baby probability. Everything is finite. Of course, when I say it's baby probability, it doesn't mean... I mean, it's baby in the sense that to state the concepts does not take much work, but they're still, right, the calculations are still incredibly clever uh, by Bourguin. So then the weighted LQ norm of F is bounded by a constant that is independent of N times the weighted L2 norm of F. So the, in, so the opposite inequality holds with constant one by holder. Right? But what Bourguin showed is that if S is a thin set, meaning it's of size n to the 2d over q, q is bigger than 2, and S is generic, okay? S doesn't have to be generic. For example, if n is prime and d is 2, and your set is a circle, then this works, and you have seen the proof. It takes a few lines of reduction from what we did, but it works, okay? So this is Bergen's result. And, and Bergen's result has been around uh, for a while, but uh, one thing that Azita and I noticed is that this result carries an uncertainty principle as a, as a kind of a fundamental property, okay? And so let me show you how this uncertainty principle works, and this will address uh, your question about improving the, the condition. Uh, so, uh, uh -huh. uh, please. Do we have some conditions of S, what the generic means? So we have like, uh, generic? Means like order of, of size should be. Okay. Uh, so, something or something. Uh, are, are you used to probability a bit? Yeah. You are. Okay, no problem. It just means that if you choose the set S randomly, oh, okay. then with incredibly high probability, oh, and, no. and by incredibly high, I mean it's one with exponential tails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So out of all the possible sets of that size, only incredibly tiny portion uh, is, not, uh, is, not, uh, is not generic. Mm -hmm. okay. Meals with respect to what? Oh, uh, the, size of, uh, the size of N. Yeah. So again, it's a, it's a lightning hitting three times, sort of. And so suppose that S is generic. In fact, never mind supposing that S is generic. Let's simply suppose that this inequality holds. Just this is the one, easy one. one second. So Please. this more inequality, it's like for for all sets or for for all N, like what? It, 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 it's a problem. It's a probability it's, statement. It's a probability that, statement, which I didn't write as a probability statement because, in my experience, probability statements scare people, and I and I don't like doing that. But it's a but if you're not scared by probability statement, it's it simply says that if S is a random set, then this estimate holds was probability one minus e to the minus. I think it's even worse than that. Yeah, I mean, like this constant k q of S. So if it's like we fix some S and and then we have for each s some constant yeah you so fix s well, and on the, the you don't use. fix s you fix the range of sizes ah okay so the scale depends like on q not on s okay. that's right mm -hmm. okay. okay and that's correct okay so suppose that estimate holds so suppose that f is supported in e and the Fourier transform is supported in s Let's rewrite Bourguin's inequality in the following way. So you notice that we pulled out n to the minus d over q. 
And we restrict it to X and E because by assumption, F is supported in E. And we normalized by the size of E and we pulled out the size of E to the one over Q. Is it clear what is being done? Okay. And then we simply put all the sizes of E on one side, all the sizes of N on the other side. And we use the fact that the L2 norm is bounded from above by the LQ norm, by holders inequality. And we just get this, that the size of E is bigger than or equal to N to the D divided by K sub Q of S to the power of one divided by one half minus one over Q. Okay, so as long as Q is bigger than two, so what did we show? We just showed that, that if F hat is supported in a typical set, or to put it another way, suppose that F hat is supported in any set for which Borgen's estimate holds. And we know that it holds for a typical set, mm -hmm. okay? And, and this set is of size n to the d minus epsilon for arbitrary but fixed epsilon. Then f is supported in a positive proportion of z and d. So remember I gave you an example. Well, even in z, even in zn, Suppose that you take an indicator function of a subgroup, okay? Then the Fourier transform is supported on the annihilator subgroup. So it's perfectly possible for a, uh, for a function to be supported in a small set and it's Fourier transform to be supported in a small set. But what we are saying here is that if the Fourier transform is supported on a generic set, Subgroups are very special, right? If it's supported on a generic set, uh, then uh, the support of E is a positive proportion of the whole space, okay? Let's think about what this means for signals. What this means for signals is if the set of missing frequencies is of size, uh, let's say one dimensional signal, is of size n to the one minus epsilon, okay? Then as long as the support of your function is less than some fixed constant times n, you can recover the signal, which is much, much stronger than what we were looking at before. And much closer to the quote unquote, the truth, meaning numerical experiment. Because another theme of the past year and a half is that every time Azita and I came up with a new result, and I told my, my son Josh, he's the co-author in the previous result, he pulled out his laptop, and within an hour, he showed us that in real life, everything is very, very different. I mean, we were not terribly shocked by this, but it was still good to see it. <laughs> you know. All right, so this makes sense? So one thing that's work in progress, it's not quite ready, uh, but will be ready in a, in a few weeks. Um, is we would like to be able to handle the case where the set of missing frequencies is like n to the d over log n instead of n to the d minus epsilon. This necessitates a kind of a logarithmic version of uh, Borgen's result, which is horrendously difficult, but it appears that it can be done. Okay. All right. So, so this is the conclusion. Uh, I have another 15 minutes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay because I was hoping to get to, uh, okay, so this is good. Uh, we can recover F exactly and uniquely with very high probability. I said that a signal supported in a set of size little o of n to the d, but we can do better than little o of n to the d. Uh, so a constant times n to the d is good enough. Okay, where this constant is something very concrete. You saw this constant, it's, it's this right here. Now this raises an interesting question of what is this constant? And um, so currently two of my PhD students, I suspect they're very unhappy with me, are going through Borgen's paper line by line and estimating this constant. It's actually good that I'm traveling these two weeks. This improves my survival chances. <laughs> <Look at that. laughs> All right. So the next result, and I'm, so this is, uh, kind of appropriate that it comes in the last 15 minutes of the lecture series 
is again an illustration of my deeply held ideology that one should not distinguish between discrete and continuous mathematics. In fact, one should not distinguish between mathematics of any kind, right? It's a, um, and uh, so there is a, a series of results in uh, analysis called spectral synthesis. Spectral synthesis is an overused word, but here's what I mean by spectral synthesis. You have a function uh, from Euclidean space to complex numbers, RD to complex numbers, and you assume that its Fourier transform is supported in some set. And this set has some properties. It's a compact set, and maybe it has some fractal dimension or whatever. And then you want to find an LP index so that if this function is an LP for P smaller than this index, then this function has to be identically zero. Okay. If you're sort of used to boundary value problems, integral geometry, et cetera, you can imagine how this might, might be useful. This is useful for proofs of uniqueness in partial differential equations. Okay, So what I'm going to illustrate is how the same idea in a discrete context leads to results about signal recovery. Okay, And I was having a conversation with, uh, with Marsha about this earlier. So one of my favorite activities in mathematics, even though it sounds a little bit frivolous, is to take problem A, problem B, you know, whatever they are, without having thought about any connection between them beforehand and try to connect them. It's just a hobby of mine, right? And this is what happened here. So first of all, theorem, L infinity norm of a signal is bounded by the square root of the size of S divided by n to the 2d over p times the LP norm. Ooh, the second bar is missing. I think this is the first typo today. Not the first. No. <laughs> there was uh, the funny word. Uh, that just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like I said, it's t, t was missing, yeah. But it doesn't converge. These things don't converge. <laughs> times the LP norm of Z and D. So again, it's a universal statement. This is always true. It's just that this constant could be terrible. And the second statement is that the L infinity norm of the signal is bounded by n to the minus d over 2, LP norm of the function, here it's correct for some reason, times the LP prime norm of the inverse Fourier transform of S. Okay, so the second one I will not have time to discuss, even though there's a lot of fun can be had. It's related to the theory of Kakea sets, et cetera, et cetera, but I will focus on the first. Okay, and so observe that what this says is that if we know, let's say a priori, that the L infinity of F is bigger than or equal to some positive delta, and this quantity is sufficiently small, then we can conclude that F is identically zero if the LP norm is uniformly bounded. In other words, we can deduce the same type of a statement that one deduces in the Euclidean case. So, okay, let's go. So first of all, let's prove the spectral synthesis and apply it, uh, this simple version of spectral synthesis, and let's apply it to signal recovery. Okay, so as we discussed, all proofs begin in this way, right? This is the first line of every proof. And you simply bound it by n to the minus d over two, size of s to the one half, times the L2 norm of the Fourier transform. Okay, so far so good. Now we apply Plancherel, and so the L2 norm of the Fourier transform equals L2 norm of the function with constant one, with constant one, okay? And this is equal to the size of S to the one half, and we bring N to the minus D inside. Why are we doing this? Because now it's a probability measure I'm not a big fan of using big words, but the whole point is I, want to, I wanted to create a setup where the L2 norm is bounded by the LP norm if P is bigger than two. And it is. One second, what happened here? It's copied probably. All right, and okay. 
So now, okay, now we are in this situations we weren't before. This was right when I said that there are no typos in this talk, right? Okay. <laughs> so this L2 norm is bounded by the LP norm. Okay. And this is the quantity, so we're done. Okay, so the so the mathematics behind this is very simple. So let me skip the proof of the second result and focus on the signal recovery. Okay? Because what I told you is a true story. I really just sat down one day, and it was only a few days ago, and I wanted to see, um, and I wanted to see, just try to build a connection between um, uh, between uh, the spectral synthesis problems and signal recovery. Okay. Now, usually, when when one tries to tries to play that game, it doesn't work. But this game, this time, it worked. Okay. So here's the result. Suppose that f maps z and d to r where the set f of x, the set of values, is delta separated. So what this means is that the gap between any two values is at least delta when f of x doesn't equal to f of y, and f of x is not constant. Okay, make sense? Okay. Now suppose that the Fourier transform is transmitted with frequencies in s are unobserved. Now, suppose that the set of S, the size of S, is a constant C size times N to the K. K, K doesn't have to be an integer. It's just anything between uh, 1 and D minus 1. Then F can be recovered exactly and uniquely if the L2D over K norm is less than delta divided by 2 times is the square root of C size. Okay? Why is this interesting? right? Because we've already seen recovery conditions. The recovery conditions we've seen before are in terms of what? They're in terms of the size of the missing frequencies. That's unavoidable, right? But the second condition is the size of the support of the function. And that is an incredibly unstable quantity. Do, do you see what I mean? Suppose you take any signal that is supported in the set E and you add random noise. That we just go, then all of a sudden the support of the signal is the whole space. Right? And ideally, if you, especially if you want to apply your results, and in mathematics we at least pretend to apply, anyway, right? One wants stable measures. Now, LP is a much more stable measure. If you add random, small random noise, you're not going to affect the LP norm very much. So here we have a recovery condition that is in terms of LP instead of the support. The condition is expressed in terms of the uh, LP one function instead of the size of the support, which is a more stable. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, let's move this. So, uh, so now our class of functions is uh, functions with a given LP norm. So before it was functions with a given support sense. Now it's with a given LP norm. And so if we cannot recover, then there exists another signal so that the LP norm of G equals LP norm of F. Um, so the values of G of X are once again delta separated. That's part of our class. And the Fourier transforms are equal outside of this. And then F is not identically equal to G otherwise. Right. So again, as we discussed, H equals F minus G. And the observation is, is that the LP norm of H is less than or equal to the LP norm of F plus LP norm of G. This is Minkowski's name, by the way. Has everybody seen it before? Okay. Now let me give you, ask you a rhetorical question. So there was no answer, but it's a question. You've, you've seen this before. So the question that I have for you now is that 
any improvement in health skills and equality right now that you can have to? Because if the answer is no, you don't know it. Abstract knowledge in mathematics is not worth it. Trying to remember the birth. Okay, no, like I said, it's a rhetorical question. I'm just it's just my my advice that I always give when I talk to my students is that all of these things need to be at the tips of your fingers. Because, um, so I have this uh, joke at the University of Rochester where I teach undergraduate classes that I want to write a book called Things Undergraduates Believe That Are Not True. And one of the things they believe that is not true is that you don't have to memorize all of these proofs because you can always look them up. But how do you know what to look up if you don't know the proofs? Right? So, okay, anyway, this is me test. And we also know that the support of H hat is contained in S since F hat and G hat agree away from us. This is cool? All right. So now, here is the point. Why did we assume that the set F of X is delta separate? Because that tells us that the L infinity norm is at least delta. Do you see why? Right, because, because it could be that the G cancels the largest values of that. But this tells us that it's going to be at least not. And now we apply the spectral synthesis in Z and D, right? You know, plus P equals 2D over K. And we get that delta is bounded by the L infinity norm of H. That's bounded by twice uh, L2D over K norm of F times the square root of C size. Uh, now, this point, maybe I should amplify and remember what the conditions said. Oh, because it got duplicated. So it's the, it's the square root of the size of S over N to the 2D over P. Right? So 2D over P is exactly K. The size of S is C size times n to the power of k. So the powers of n cancel, and you're just left with the square root of c signs. So now let's go back to where we were. And this is why we get square root of c signs here. And sorry about the question marks. So you follow us that if we assume that the opposite condition, right? Remember the opposite condition go back to the school, that this is true. Then we have a contradiction, and H has to be a given to the scale. Okay. So again, let me stress the point. Do you, do you see why it's useful to have the condition in terms of the LB norm? Right? Because the sparsity is not a stable condition. Because sparsity, a sparse function, becomes a function, by sparse I mean that it has very few non-zero values. A sparse function becomes a function that's not very sparse if you just add small random points. Okay? And, and if you're, for example, dealing with any sorts of data science applications, small random noise occasionally has to be added for whatever reason. Okay? So it's useful to have a formulation that is in terms of the element. It's almost similar to discrete function because we have what we know, non bounded, we have a step of delta. We have kind of. Uh, well, the step is at most. No, at, at least, 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 least delta. Yeah, at least delta. Of, so, yeah. so, <laughs> Some similarity. So, one of many things that I'm not going to have time to describe is applications to time series analysis and data science. Uh, so, so there you're almost always working with discretized functions anyways. So you begin by discretizing a function. And so how do you discretize a function? You discretize it so that the error you're making in the process of discretization is no more than the error you can afford. Which means that this delta condition is not really a restrictive condition, you're always working with such functions in the first place. Yeah. Cool. 
Okay, and I think that this is a good start. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.